that lead to a model that's not too simple and not too complex and then is more likely to be realistic in the environmental space in our study region and our time of uh, analysis, but also uh, more uh, valid and more useful for transfer across uh, space and especially uh, for uh, across time. So as we've uh, gone through several times, our current staters suffer from uh, several things, and among others, as Chris was talking, our bias sample in geographic space, which may also be biased in environmental space. Mm -hmm. And these are both problems. <laughs> Even if you only have bias, space, uh, bias sampling in geography, um, it still can affect uh, your evaluation and inflate your estimates of performance. Um, but the, the even worse problem is when those biases in geographic space correspond to biases in environmental variables. And then you, number one, uh, have the, you're likely to have your model fit the signal of sampling. And several years ago, many, many years ago, I was giving a talk and um, one of the biologists there raised his hand and he said, well, how do you know that you're modeling the niche of the species and not the niche of the collector? And so, and I, I didn't have very good answers to him at that point and really didn't understand deeply these issues of um, sampling bias, um, but that's what we're trying to avoid here. Okay? And we talked about lots of ways that you can um, try to address that from the occurrence data side. And now we're going to see a little bit of that uh, on, the, um, on the side of building the model. Okay? And that also has to do with well, how can you evaluate it in a way that would allow you to detect um, any fitting to a purpose. So if your model is overly complex, it overfits either to bias or to noise, and then it should transfer poorly, unfortunately. And I'm going to use examples from Maxent because I've, for several years, been working with that technique to try to go deeper and deeper and figure out what it's doing and when it works well and when it doesn't, what kind of problems come up, and what can we do to make those better. But these principles should be very general and applied to um, most any technique you would want to use. Uh, some of them are only relevant to presence, well, techniques that uh, compare presence data to some comparison data set, whereas others are uh, relevant also for even profile techniques that really only use presence data. So in that sense, complexity depends on many things, and these are three of uh, the things that uh, can affect complexity of the model. One is the number of variables that you provide as possible um, variables to use. Another is the particular feature classes that you allow the model to try to use. And we'll see more about that. And the third is the level of regularization. Um, so let's talk just a bit about this one. This is the, the flexibility that you give Maxent in order to form the shape of the response curve. So you could say, I only wanted to use linear features. It can only do things like this. If you have linear and quadratic, then it can make a, a more complex shape. If you, have, um, if you have something called hint features, it means it can draw a whole bunch of little, little linear lines and connect them. So that you could have a, a, very, a very complex shape response. Okay? Um, regularization. People have probably run up uh, with this if they use Maxent. Who has an, an intuitive definition of what that is? I don't have. Um, you ask me who has? Yes. I don't, sorry. <laughs> 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 I just the other way. Uh -huh. <laughs> the degree of adjustment of the curve to the, to the sampling points? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah, kind of the degree of fitting, right? How closely. Your, it's related to how closely the model fits the actual data points um, that were fed into the model. Okay? And why is it that it's related to that? Or if you have high regularization, do you have high fitting? Or, or if you have low regularization, do you have high fit? Do you, does anybody know those? Low regularization, very high fit. 
Yes. And my organization will Okay, yes. Okay. And does anybody know why? Okay. So Regularization is a penalty that's applied for including uh, additional uh, features in the model, additional terms into the model, and for giving those terms higher weight. So if you have no penalty against that, it will include a lot of terms and high weights to some of those, and very closely fit um, the relationship of the occurrences to, um, to the environmental variables uh, of those presence localities compared to what's available. If you have uh, a, you know, some moderate level of penalties, then it's not going to be as complex. Because for some terms, uh, they're so important that it's worth including those in, in the model, even if it gets penalized for doing so, right? But for other terms which just make the model a little bit better, a little better closer fit to your data, it's not worth it if that penalty is stronger. Okay? All right. So, so that's regularization. Um, and I guess I should say there are equivalent uh, techniques uh, for GAMS, for example, the lasso. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of that. So this is a uh, the idea of penalties for additional complexity is something that cuts across several kinds of, um, of algorithms. So this is, um, what I'm going to present is from one paper um, that's um, early view now in the journal about geography. And can our Serbian friend say the name of my co-author? Okay. <laughs> so this is a student of mine uh, whose parents are, were both from Serbia. Call him Alex or something? We call them Alex. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we compare different ways to subset data, and we vary the regularization parameter. In other studies, we've also varied the kinds of feature classes that we allow Maxent uh, to use. Um, and keep in mind that um, even if you put 19 variables or 100 variables into Maxent, the final model doesn't necessarily use all of those especially if you have a high level of regularization, a lot of penalty applied for including variables and including features in the model, okay? In the traditional approach, which has been called the random split sample approach, um, we're dividing our training and our test points completely randomly. Um, but this is a fairly easy test, especially if we have records close to each other, and especially if um, sampling is, is biased in space, okay? Um, and this kind of test can detect overfitting to noise, random noise in our data, but it can't detect overfitting to any bias. And that's because the, if we're dividing these records randomly, the same bias that in the overall data set is going to be preserved in the training set and in the test set. Um, so. And um, can someone in their own words uh, explain your intuitive definition of what I mean by overfitting. So you are mostly having a suitability model of the data you collected. So it's not suitability, it's more like you are feeding to the data you are collected, so you are not having the fundamental niche, you are having mostly your data model. Okay, right. And it, it's a, a, a general concept in in modeling, um, not just niche modeling, uh, but that's a, a very good example. So it's somewhere where the model relationship is more complex than the real relationship in nature. So let me draw a little um, graph here. Even imagine we just have Some points like this, right? If we have, let's say, some complex function that goes like that, it predicts these points really, really well, right? If and if an independent sample uh, from the same um, phenomenon ends up having <coughs> values like this, this complex model is great, right? If, however, some of that apparent waviness was just 
um, something due to the vagaries of that particular first sample, and we get our second sample that looks more like this. How good is our fancy model? Okay, not so good. And a model like that would actually do better in predicting the second data set. Okay, so the, the, in this uh, second case, this curvy line would be overfit to the training data. And whereas a simpler relationship like that would be more realistic. <coughs> so any questions about that example of overfitting? Okay, so we're talking about that kind of thing. Now how many of you have used Maxent or any other technique that gives you a graph of the response curves to the individual variables? Now you've looked at those. And what do they look like? The response curve? Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on the variable. Mm -hmm. Like that. They're kind of histograms and that kind yeah. of thing. I mean, are they kind of like this, or are they choppy, or? Oh, yeah. They're never linear. They're never linear. Okay. <laughs> if, if, if you only told it to use linear features, it would be linear, right? Yeah, I've combined it. Shape. Do they it's seem usually like this? Or like this? Do they seem smooth or do they seem jagged? Smooth. smooth. Okay. All right. Has anybody gotten uh, response curves that are really yeah. jaggedy? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes with okay. some variables. Some variables. Are very All right. Um, so that probably has to do with how many occurrence records you have and the level of regularization, for example. Um, there's some very nice papers by Catherine Graham and Jane Ellis. They talk about response curves, and, and what I'm going to talk about uh, when we tune regularization is, uh, I'm going to call it tuning, right? But this whole approach is also called smoothing, okay? And it's the same thing with the idea of smoothing these response curves so that they're more realistic and they're not so jacked. Okay? So a different approach to um, subsetting our data is where we have spatial subsets. And uh, several years ago, um, there was a paper by Marujo and Raybeck about climate change projections. And it called for evaluations across space um, in order to demonstrate effective performance before we transfer across time. And I saw that and I thought this is a really important uh, point. And so we started this project um, to, to look at that. Okay. So, um, the particular way we have done this, I'm not sure if this is the next slide, yes. So, um, so we've done cross-validation, uh, okay, full cross-validation, very simple. This species, we're looking at the northern distribution of this pocket mouse in Colombia, Venezuela, and we said, okay, let's divide it into four uh, bands, right? And we divided this um, by longitude. So this is our first, uh, and so there's going to be four iterations, like any um, k-fold with, with k equals four. And the first one, we're making the model with these records and evaluating with those. Second iteration, we leave these out and save them for evaluation. Then third, and then fourth. So if the, this, so this should be able to detect um, any overfitting to noise, just like the other one, but also if the <coughs> sampling biases in uh, environmental space are different across our study region, then we have the possibility of detecting any overfitting to uh, those that sampling bias in environmental space. Okay, um, because because these subsets are not random; they are spatially segregated. If, however, there's the same uh, environmental bias here, and here, and here, and here. Uh, we, we can't detect that. So that's a caveat of this approach. If collectors have consistently gone the same kinds of places throughout the whole study region, um, we still could overfit to that bias and not be able to detect it. Okay? I have questions. Yes. If you, if you get into me doing for example, 
uh, running into a problem that you are climbing your environmental space in this situation. <coughs> yes. Especially if you do it not in longitude, in longitude, but it in latitude, speed. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So as you design, <coughs> if you want to do spatially independent evaluations, as you design how you want to segregate those spatially, you need to think about what kind of test you want to, to do, right? Do you want a test of how well it performs in different spaces that have similar environmental ranges? You should um, design your segregations in one way. If you want, if you think you're going to be applying into other time periods where you're going to have to extrapolate in environmental space, then you might as well design things here so that the splits over space force the model to extrapolate in environmental space into non-analog conditions. So for example, uh, in one uh, study where they are not going to be transferring across time, but they still want these kind of um, segregated evaluations, um, an associate of ours has, um, has implemented what he calls a checkerboard approach. So we have lots of smaller um, segregations that are then accumulated into bins, but they're spread out. Okay. okay? So that's a very good question, and it depends upon what you want to demonstrate in this exercise. Okay, so our two friends, um, AUC and omission rate. So remember that um, the AUC is going to be a relative measure of performance, because this is Preston's background, AUC. And this is going to be a single study region and a single species. So these relative measures of performance should be informative. Um, omission and high values are good, so we need to know there really. Um, omission rates, we know what omission rates are, and low values are good. Okay? Um, we also want to remember that we we do, we are convinced from the beginning that, like a typical museum data set, that there are probably geographic um, biases in sampling, and we're afraid that there are also um, environmental biases in sampling. But we don't have the data for an overall target group to be able to use some of the uh, more sophisticated approaches that Chris talked about, and we don't have the ability to go into all the field notes and quantify sampling to use um, uh, a bias surface as he was talking about. So we're saying, well, what can we do in these kind of common situations where we can't do is option two or option three? Okay? And one thing we are doing is we are filtering our occurrence records, um, but even with the filtered occurrence records, you still have the possibility of an overfit model. Okay? 